Okay, I'm gonna try to do this momentarily from my phone. Um, but I can't see from my phone your comments on the side. Hold on, I'm restarting my computer. Um, oh, can you guys hear me? Can you guys let me know if you can hear? Is this better? So this is my phone. I'm just waiting for my computer to restart. Um, but hi everybody, this is Paul Wishmeyer, and uh, it's great to see everyone again. Um, I'm gonna work from my phone here for a moment until I can get my computer working better. Um, and I'm gonna try to answer the questions that everybody sent in, and also try to address some of the new data that we're getting from our metabolic heart study, our LEAP COVID study, where we're doing metabolic heart um, every other day and muscle mass um, ultrasound, and we're also doing uh, body composition through BIA. Okay, good. Um, and so we, we've started to do that research and the surprising things, let's see if I can actually put this phone somewhere that it can sit so I can try to talk to you guys while I do this, great. Um, so we're, we're finding some surprising things actually. And some of the things that we're finding are that early on, the patient's calorie needs are, are much lower than we thought in the first week. So we're seeing calorie needs of 15 and 17 kcals per kilo in that first week of critical illness, um, which is much lower. So we're seeing 40 to 60% of predicted. So that first week seems to be much lower. And then strikingly, in the second week, um, and third weeks, we've done some later patients, we're seeing much higher than expected um, needs in our patients. I'm gonna to try to set this this way, actually. Um, we're seeing much higher needs than we expected as um, 25 and 28 kcals per kilo. We're seeing energy expenditures in the 2900 range in people that we were predicting 14 and 1500 and even. So we've seen anywhere from 24 to 2900 in the second and third week. So it looks like a little bit like the curves you've seen some of the papers I'm posting in, where there's a very low initial um, decrease in caloric needs, so like 60 to 80% of predicted, which goes along with the best survival being at 70% of predicted calories. Um, and then it seems to increase in the second and third weeks to maybe 130, 140% of predicted, where we're seeing caloric requirements in 70 and 80 kilo men of anywhere from 2,400 to 2,900 calories. So it's, it's very striking. There's this rise that's even bigger than expected in the patients that we're seeing. And some of the patients, interestingly, are consuming a lot of fat, and when we retest them, then they seem to shift back and forth between fat and carbohydrate, which is really interesting. Um, but what I think is striking is much lower than expected caloric needs. Um, I think that was one of the key things that I really wanted to convey to everybody and I'm also going to try to log in via my computer now. So, um, and then pull up the questions. I had to reshut everything down. So I'm gonna pull up the questions that you guys sent in, but I know a lot of those questions were, um, were related to the data that we're seeing in, in metabolic heart needs. So I think that's pretty striking in what we're seeing. And I'm gonna try to go live here from my computer and also pull up uh, the questions that we had from before. So let's see how that works. And let me pull up the questions right now from Priscilla. She sent them this morning. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Okay, where did they go? Oh, I have them right here. Okay, great. So the, the correlations, the interesting things that we're seeing um, let me see here if I can do both things at once. Maybe I can't. Um, yeah, no, I'm not gonna try for my computer. I'm just gonna stick to, I'm gonna stay on the page so I can see your comments and I can see the chat, but I'm gonna use my phone to be able to communicate with you. Hopefully you'll be able to see that. And I'm gonna try to stop the video somehow. Can everybody still see the video? So somebody, I can see people asking, um, so to repeat some of those questions. And so we are seeing, like I said, some really big drops in metabolic need early. 
and then some really big increases later. Um, God, I would love to be able to see your questions at the same time that I can stop this video. Um, let's see if I can do that. Maybe I can. Because uh, I would like to be able to see your, your comments on the side. I don't know how to do that, so I am going to stay with my phone. Okay. So, and then I, what I was saying late is, is that we're seeing big increases in caloric need um, above and beyond what your equations would predict. Um, and we haven't done a lot of patients, so I'm not going to say this is gospel yet, but we've been impressed that we've seen big jumps um, in weeks two and three. And so I think this has been very striking. We're continuing to do more patients. We're enrolling three or four patients a day. Um, so we're going to have a lot more data. And then we're doing our measurements every second or third day. So we're beginning to follow people out now. We actually have a couple measurements in a row on a few people. Um, the numbers have been fairly consistent. The other good news is we are doing the metabolic carts on peeps of up to 16. So the requirements for the limitations of the old metabolic carts do not seem to apply to this, the new metabolic cart, the Q Energy device. So that's really wonderful news. And I think really exciting that these metabolic carts now can be used, the new Q Energy device can be used in peeps that go up to 14 and 16. Um, and I can see a question from Robin, weeks two of three of hospitalization or from initial onset. So these are weeks two and three from intubation, typically. Um, a lot of our patients that we have right now were intubated very shortly after their admission to the hospital. So these are weeks two of three after ICU admission, which in uh, most of our cases <clears throat> is also weeks two or three after hospital admission. And so I think that um, that's really, I think, a, a key finding that we're seeing right now. And so we're really struck by that. And so um, I'm looking at your questions now, and um, I'm actually getting data from Leap COVID sent to me right now um, by text. It says, we're having many patients losing significant amounts of weight despite being fairly well fed. And, and so I wonder if that is some of what you're seeing is this really hypermetabolic state that's happening in these patients later in their care that I think is really striking um, and, and really compelling. So I wonder if we're underfeeding some of these patients late and I think it's also very key not to be overfeeding early. I think we're learning that, again, we're seeing 60, 75% of predicted from your calculations in that first week. We're seeing very low numbers in the initial patients we're doing with QNRG. And then we're seeing, as I said yesterday and today, we saw 2,900 in patients that are, again, second and third week, 14, 15 days out. So it seems to be, again, the flat, in fact, the drop in the curve and then the big jump in the curve. And I think that's why you're seeing so much weight loss. So I think it's essential that you provide protein to these patients. And I think your calories need to increase in that second and third week. And I think that's really important for you to consider. Um, and, I, and I think, honestly, I would begin to look. Um, so I'm looking at some questions here from, from Eric. Are we doing multiple readings of the same 24 hour period? No, but we are doing readings as often as every other day. So like we did a reading today in one of the patients in the ICU that I work in, I've known this patient very well, where we did a reading uh, two days ago and then we did a reading today. And we're seeing very similar, in fact, almost increased caloric requirements. We're seeing, we saw 2,400 three days ago, we saw 2,700 today. And so I think this is very impressive and, and we'll continue to get more and more data for you guys and I'll share it with you. But I do think in that second and third week, um, you, the ramping of the calories probably seems reasonable. We'll continue to update that. I, I can't say I've done so many patients that this is gospel yet, but we hope when we get to 20 or 30, we're going to publish this. So I think this is really compelling to say that the caloric needs are going up. We don't really measure a lot of inflammatory markers. We're, I'm getting questions about inflammatory markers. There aren't a lot of inflammatory markers that we measure. And so I think that... Um, Really, it's just their clinical situation. And, and in the patient that I'm talking about who jumped 24, 2700, if Leslie's listening, she'll know who this is. Our dietitian at Duke has been caring for this patient. Um, so this patient is starting to recover. Um, he's, the patient's weaning on the vent. Um, this is a mid-40s individual who's weaning on the vent. And, uh, and, and so he's improving. And so it's not surprising that his caloric needs are jumping, although they're jumping more than I would have predicted, and I think more than our equations would have predicted. 
And so I think some of the things you consider, you can consider to deal with this weight loss that I think I'm going to start to think about in our patients is um, some of the HMB containing formulas. I think maybe even switching to Insurin Live, adding, um, and I'm, I'm going to say that product name because it's the only HMB containing formula that you, you can get. Um, maybe moving to that HMB containing formula or giving HMB. Although I think early, I don't love Juven. Maybe if you're getting into these second and third weeks and they're recovering, maybe Juven's not so bad. Uh, that might be an option. I don't love the arginine in it, but I love the HMB in it. You could also use some Insurin Live down your tubes, I suppose, as well, right? Because the HMB is really good at attenuating muscle loss and improving um, positive nitrogen balance and improving muscle synthesis. It's an mTOR agonist. The other thing that I'm a old time burn physician, I did a lot of burn critical care. We used oxandrolone in everybody. And at Duke, we used testosterone in a lot of people. Uh, I can tell you that a critical care patient's testosterone levels are less than 50 or even zero um, within a five days of admission. And there's published data that shows they go to zero very, very quickly, usually within three days. And that's the typical published data. My hunch is, and I haven't begun to check, but I'm gonna start checking in these COVID patients, they're very, very low. And so using testosterone or oxandrolone, the oxandrolone dose is 10 milligrams twice a day. Oxandrolone is the best of the anabolic uh, uh, agents. And so I think that that is, if you have oxandrolone in your formulary, those of you with burning will have it, that is the, the best choice. You can give it down the tube. It's an oral medication. It has almost no androgenic effects. It's very safe on the liver. We give it for months and months and even years to burn patients very safely. You can also use testosterone patches. That's what we use at Duke. And we also use IM testosterone cipronate. If you use the patch, I'd start at four milligrams and check in five days. If you're going to use testosterone cipronate, I'd give 200 milligrams IM twice a week. Uh, or I'm sorry, once every two weeks. I said that wrong. 200 milligrams once every two weeks. Uh, and, and then I check a level about seven days in to see that you bump their level above 200. You want to get the testosterone above 200. And so I, Jenny asked, um, what about Juven in week two? It has HMB and arginine. I think if you can get them out of that acute phase where they don't have a secondary pneumonia, they don't have, um, you know, ongoing shock-like conditions. Now, we're finding a lot of patients are sitting on some norepinephrine because of all the sedation we're giving them, I think, more than anything. Um, they're sitting at little small doses of norepinephrine for long periods of time. Um, if those patients aren't actively uh, infected and getting worse or unstable or by any means, or that vasopressor dose isn't jumping around a lot, I think, you know, if you get into week two or three, as Fred Moore has described, and I can put his paper up on the post-intensive care, the, 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 the immunosuppression syndrome, the PICS syndrome is the name of it, that patients get into later in their critical care, maybe that's what we're starting to see. Um, and maybe the HMB and RG wouldn't be so bad at that point. Now, those of you who saw the nutrition webinar this morning, um, Arthur Van Zanten, uh, Elizabeth DeWall, and myself talked about RG, and all of us agreed we wouldn't want to use it in COVID if we could avoid it, especially in the first probably two weeks. But as you get later and later, if the patient's recovering, I mean, maybe that's not such a bad time to think about something like Juven. I still don't love the arginine, but I do love the HMB. There's really strong data for HMB. So I'm trying to get at some of those weight loss questions that you've asked. That was the second question that, that um, really came up in the common questions that, that the, the group sent me. And so I'm going to look at the next one. Risk is associated, uh, risk associated with not feeding obese patients, especially for patients with obesity and sarcopenia. Um, some people may not feel in a rush to feed these patients. Do not let them do that. Do not let them do that, I will tell you. Obese patients, typically we are finding, have amongst the worst sarcopenia. You really have to be worried about sarcopenia. And I'm going to have some muscle data to show you guys soon from the actual COVID patients over time. So I'm going to be able to tell you about the muscle mass. Um, and so we'll be able to really tell you a lot more about their muscle mass um, when we get the muscle ultrasound data going here shortly. And so that, I think that'll be really helpful. But do not be lulled into thinking that your obese patients do not need to be fed. That's when you want to use your higher protein, your two grams per kilo, and your BMIs of 30 or above, even two and a half grams per kilo um, of protein. Um, I think like things like HMB and perhaps oxandrolone are useful to maintain that. Um, so I, do not be fooled into thinking the obese patient um, needs to be on a diet, right? This is the classic teaching that you'll hear physicians say. Um, we had a really good talk this morning on the nutrition webinar about using supplemental PN. Um, 
and, and we've talked about it in our unit too. Now we've been able to individually feed pretty much everybody, but I think there are a number of patients that have been stuck at about 50% of goal because of residuals. We have a lot of high residuals, more than I've ever seen in a typical lung injured patient. And we've had to hold feedings for proning and turning. I think if you're sticking below 50% of goal, 60% of goal for more than three to five days, I would start supplemental PN in those patients. There is very good data, and I can post this, it's this study. Um, Meta Berger and her group in Switzerland, one of the best TPN groups, one of the best nutrition groups in the world, did a trial that was published in Lancet that showed that when people didn't meet goal by th about three to five days and they started supplemental PN, those patients had many fewer late infections. And that's the things that are getting our patients at least, and I bet some of yours, we're getting a lot of secondary bacterial infections. That is probably contributed to by malnutrition because it's so hard to get to goal and stay at goal in these patients. That study showed that if you use supplemental PN, their infection rate dives considerably. They have far less infections on TPN. I really need to post this paper for you guys because I think this is exactly what we're seeing in these patients late is that they're getting underfed because it's so difficult to get to goal in these people and stay at goal. And I would really advise supplemental PN with an alternative lipid, again, either an olive oil-based lipid or the fish oil based lipid, whichever you can get in your hospital. Um, and if you don't have it, I'm gonna say it again. There's no reason a critical care patient in the United States should be getting intralipid anymore ever. So please, if you don't have that approved, get it approved. Um, and so, but I think supplemental PN with a good lipid is a really good path to go down in these patients to prevent that weight loss and to attenuate infections. I think some of these secondary infections are really going back to malnutrition and the difficulty we're having feeding. And so, again, as we said last webinar, parental nutrition has no association with infection risk at all when given in the ICU versus intral. And there's no more risk of putting parental nutrition through a central line than there is of putting saline through a central line. And I can send you guys those trials. I've sent out the Nurse trial. It's a New England Journal. But there's four large randomized trials that show that. And I really want you guys to take that back to your clinicians. I know that is not something most of your physicians know. That is not something they were taught in medical school. But I think this is your opportunity and our opportunity to re-educate a whole generation of critical care physicians on the real facts and the evidence that show the safety of TPN and the benefit in these patients who are so hard to feed. So I'm gonna move down, micronutrient probiotic uh, supplements. So personally and professionally, what would you say the target is? Um, I'm gonna answer this question real quick. Jennifer Cho just asked, how about for the patients with fungemia? So again, if your patients are actively bacteremic or fungemic, um, we have a policy at Duke where we stop the TPN typically for about 48 hours until the cultures are negative for 48 hours. Um, it's tough for me to say if that's the right thing or not. It is our policy, and I, and I think in the past um, there was some support for that. But now I think knowing what malnutrition does to immune compromise and the fact that we have a much better lipid and we use much less dextrose than we used to and we control glucose, these are all the reasons why TPN are not causes infection anymore. This is not the TPN of the 90s or the 80s. Um, I think it's really essential to reconsider how we do TPN and, and I don't know that I know the best answer, but it isn't consistent throughout the world that TPN has stopped for patients who are fungemic and bacteremic, but I can't give you enough data to say which way you should go. But what I, I would say is once your cultures are clear for 48 hours, it do, we definitely restart. And um, I think in most centers, we definitely restart. And so I think there's a much greater safety here. So, but I wanna get to, what do you think a goal is for a vitamin D level? Um, and the person said, I'm a big fan of vitamin D. Uh, I am too. I, I hope, you know, we are, are getting close to starting. We're submitting for a grant into the IRB this week, our probiotic trial, and I would love to factorialize in a vitamin D arm. Um, so your goal realistically is to get your patients above 20 to 30. You definitely want them above 20. We know that's the deficient level and ideally above 30. And so it's going to take, and I'm, I'm going to tell you, it's going to take probably 100,000 units of D3, um, at least 50, but that almost never changes a critical care patient. You really need 100,000 units. And if you remember the JAMA study that showed the mortality benefit of vitamin D and low vitamin D levels gave 500, 500,000 units as a single dose once a month to the patients. And nobody got hypocalcemic, nobody got high vitamin D levels from that, but they were normal for about three to four weeks. And so um, I like the Emory study. If there's anyone from Emory, there, there's a nice study that Tom Ziegler and Greg Martin and others did, where they gave 100,000 units a day of D3 for five days. And so I like to give it for two to three to four days, depending on how low the patient is. 
uh, but it's gonna take 100,000 units for a couple days to correct. But there is outstanding data that vitamin D reduces the risk of viral infection. Um, it does have to be D3. Uh, ideally, I see somebody is asking, Jen's asking if you have D2 in liquid form. You should see if you have a pediatric side of your hospital, like at Duke, we have pediatric drops that I use that are very concentrated. If you have a ped side, you might have some very concentrated pediatric drops you can use. Um, that's how we do it. Um, there are those D3 capsules that are 50,000 units a piece. Maybe they can put those into the tubes. Um, but ideally, almost all the supportive data in the ICU and even in the uh, meta-analyses are for D3. And so I really would encourage you to stay with D3. Um, so can you comment, Mary, Mary Heis, who, who is one of the wisest people I know, can you um, comment about adequate feeding with anabolic steroids? Again, she's saying you don't, you don't get good benefit unless you adequately feed. That is absolutely true. I think if you're going to use um, anabolic steroids, if you're going to use oxandrolone or, or something like that, you absolutely have to be feeding to goal. And that's where you might want to come in with your supplemental parental nutrition or TPN if you can't feed them. Um, probably within three to four days, much earlier than you would normally probably, I would suggest, given how hypermetabolic and the extreme high VO2s we're seeing. We're seeing real hypermetabolism after the first week. Um, but you definitely need to be sure they're fed. The protein is the most important. 1.5 to 2 grams per kilo per day. Get that in um, if you're going to use the anabolic agents. But I can tell you I've used them for 20 plus years safely. So they, when fed well, like we do in the burning, right? We feed very well in the burning. Um, they're very successful. They're very beneficial for the patients. Um, I'm going to come back to the vitamin D. I think again, so curious about vitamin D deficiency in renal patients with or without CRT. I think again, a hundred thousand units would be useful potentially for these patients rather than 50,000 units. And, and I think that's still true in the HD CRT population. And then I would check levels once every two weeks to be sure you're, you're maintaining an adequate level. And then in terms of the dosages of vitamin D and copper, um, so again, as we said before, in the CVVH patient in particular, or the malnourished patient that comes in with big GI losses, now we're seeing 20 to 30% of patients have significant GI involvement. As I said before, we have patients who are positive on their stool swabs, but are not positive for COVID on their nasal swabs. And so you can have isolated GI disease. Um, I think, especially on CVVH though, uh, your 90% of your patients, our data will show, are copper deficient within five to seven days. And many are vitamin B6 deficient, many are selenium, zinc, carnitine deficient. And so, you know, we have a couple options for copper. Today I heard, um, again, many people in Europe are giving IV trace elements and micronutrients and vitamins every day until patients are on full enteral feeds. And Meta, uh, Reed Vandenberg does that, Arthur Van Zanten does that. I'm, I think Leslie and I should chat at Duke here about us doing that in these patients as well, because um, it's really becoming a, a standard in Europe. And I think, especially on CRT, if you're not going to do it on anybody else, CRT, probably everybody should be getting some sort of IV trace elements and micronutrients. Um, you can give some Flintstone vitamins. They have copper in them down the tube, but that won't correct people who are deficient. I'm not even sure it'll keep people normal, but I think it could help. So that's another thing you can do is some Flintstone's vitamins. But I do think... Copper, you can give copper gluconate if you have it intrally to about two milligrams. You could also give IV copper. Um, it can be given somewhere between two and four milligrams for five days. That will correct most people. But the reality is if you stay on CRT, the levels are going to continue to drop. It's not something you can give once and then have it go away because it's continued to be lost in the CVVH CRT patients. So you're going to continue to have these losses. Uh, and so I think that's something you're really going to have to pay attention to. Um, I don't know that you're going to be able to check them all the time when you want. These are send out labs. Um, we do, we do send them out at Duke some, um, and we've gotten a lot of data because of that, and we hope to have a paper out to you soon about it, but we are definitely seeing 90% are copper deficient in seven days. Many are vitamin B6 deficient. Again, the dose is 50 milligrams a day of vitamin B6 to correct people. Um, and then carnitine deficiency. Somewhere between 300 and 500 milligrams a day is a good maintenance dose to keep carnitine normal. If they're deficient, probably 500-ish milligrams a day will correct them and then switch back to 300 milligrams for the rest of their CRT run if they're deficient. And so, but again, zinc, selenium, all these things can become deficient as can vitamin C and thiamine. I'm giving a lot of vitamin C and thiamine routinely to the COVID patients. There's a lot of good data that vitamin C reduces lung leak. We use it in the burn unit at a gram an hour IV and it has the fluid requirements and reduces ARDS. 
Um, I've seen basic science data that's phenomenal that it seals up the leak when sepsis or critical illness is occurring from the vasculature. And so we've been giving um, a gram and a half IV Q6 vi IV vitamin C um, in, in a fair number of our patients. And especially people on pressors who still have a big lung leak, I think that can really be to your advantage. So the next question that I have here is the pharmacy's apprehensive of probiotics um, on immunocompromised patients. Would you recommend uh, in any way? So, you know, it's, it's definitely been given in a, a range of immunosuppressed patients uh, in the data. Now that said, can I assure you without a doubt that there's no risk that someone won't get, say, lactobacillus in their bloodstream that has been reported mostly in children. Um, we can't actually demonstrate that that caused a risk or that caused a um, significant adverse outcome in them in most of these case reports. Um, but we, I've definitely been giving it to a number of the COVID patients in our ICUs. Um, we give lactobacillus GG, uh, 20 billion um, a day is the recommended dose. That's the dose we're gonna study. The trial we're submitting to the RB here at Duke, we have approval to submit and we have some funding and hopefully, and we're gonna hopefully get some more and, and we're gonna give 20 billion units to the family members of positive COVID patients. So we're gonna reach out to family members um, and anybody who comes in positive with COVID, we're gonna reach out to them and we're gonna to offer to send them a month's worth of either the probiotic or the placebo and treat them and have them report their symptoms. We're also gonna collect microbiome samples, stool and nasal swabs. We're gonna test them for COVID. We're gonna test their stool for COVID. We're gonna do microbiome longitudinally once a week for their entire treatment course is the plan for this trial. And we're using Lactobacillus GG, we're using Culturel. Um, they've been gracious enough to give us the product for this study. You can get Culturel at the store, you can get it online. Um, and again, 20 billion, um, a day is about what you should give. I see a question about PO vitamin C. Um, great question. I, I think you could try that. Um, you'd have to give more than a thousand milligrams probably a day to get decent absorption. But I, I can't tell you that won't be useful as well. I think that's very reasonable to try. Um, I think while they're septic and they're impressors, I would use it uh, probably with uh, it being IV. But I think if you're intrally fed really nicely and they're not impressors and you know their gut's working, they're at goal feeds, I think it'd be fine to give it PO. I think that would be a very reasonable thing. I'm taking emergency and vitamin C every day myself. Um, uh, my kids are taking it. My kids are taking probiotics and vitamin D every day. So I think it'd be very reasonable to do that. There's some decent antiviral data for vitamin C as well. Not as good as it is for probiotics or for vitamin D, but there is some. Um, and so I would think about that. So, but to come back to the probiotic question, it says I've, we've recommended LGG and um, lactobacillus GG and plantarum specifically. But what if lactobacillus acidophilus bulgaris is only probiotic on formulary? Would I still recommend? I would still recommend. Um, I think there's a lot of data in the basic science. I even understand it now better than I did last time I talked to you because I've written a whole grant on it now. Um, there's phenomenal data in now uh, a number of different animal models too that lactobacillus, a number of different lactobacillus species produce antiviral peptides in the lung that reduce influenza infectivity, reduce um, mortality from influenza, and they make the animals more immune from a secondary exposure to the virus later. So they seem to maintain a greater immunity longer, which all of us would benefit from if COVID persists like we think it will. I, I think a, a fact that I just learned is the fastest the United States has ever made a vaccine or even in the world has made a vaccine is four years for mumps. And so I hope we have a vaccine in a year, but it could be two or three years. And remember, we'll need probably 600 million doses because everyone will probably have to get dosed twice, they're saying. Um, so you're talking about a capacity that we don't have in this country to produce the vaccine. And so I think we're gonna be dealing with COVID for a long time. And so uh, Kendall's asking, Kendall Rother's asking, lactobacillus acidophilus, I think that's fine. Um, there's a range of lactobacillus studies in the literature. The meta-analysis that I've put online for you guys has a lot of different kinds of probiotics that are used. The, um, the probiotic studies in C. diff use a lot of different kinds of probiotics and they all seem to be very successful against C. diff. So I think if you have a lactobacillus species, great, you should use it. It doesn't have to be GG. I think we have the best data and understanding for lung injury or lung pneumonias with plantarum and GG. But if you have another one, use it because the lactobacilli all seem to have somewhat similar benefits in the animal models and in the clinical data because so many different trials use so many different ones. And so I think that's just fine. Um, so let me keep going down the list. Uh, how long taking zinc will put you at risk for carbon deficiency? Clearly, um, yeah, all, all, all the wise dietitians know and, that 
taking too much zinc can lead to copper deficiency. Um, they, they inhibit each other absorption. So I, I would be careful. There isn't a lot of great data for zinc supplementation on its own. Um, so I think I would be careful about big dose zinc supplementation without deficiency. I don't think I would turn to that as something I would just jump to in COVID patients. Um, I think that's something you should think hard about. I think you, if you suspect deficiency, if you're on CRT, then I think you're okay. Robin V. is asking about arginine. I think this is a grand question. So there is data, and I posted some of it online if you want to look back in my posts, that arginine early in pneumonia patients in particular, but also septic patients, there's a number of trials of semi-good quality. I mean, I won't say they're the best in the world. I will tell you that, that one of the trials didn't want, the, the company didn't want to publish it in the late 90s because it was so negative. And Darren Hyland and others who were in the trial um, forced them to publish because it showed increased mortality in these patients. And the reason we think that is because arginine drives nitric oxide pathways to create instability and immunotoxicity. Um, and we think there really is a risk of increased mortality in that first week, especially um, from arginine. So, and we, I asked that question to Arthur Van Zanten and to Elizabeth DeWall, who are both nutrition experts in their own right, and none of them are using the arginine-containing formulas either. They all believe that the data just is too risky to support this. And so I think I would avoid the arginine in the first week or two. Now that said, I think it's worth, and I should probably post it, the, the PICS data, this immunosuppressed syndrome, this chronic immunosuppression that happens in a lot of ICU patients later, which our COVID patients may very well be getting, especially the malnourished ones, where maybe later when they're more stable, the arginine formulas may be beneficial. I mean, uh, in our ICU Duke, Leslie Murray, our dietitian, who has made this really wonderful sheet that I definitely find, need to find a way to post for you guys. She made this really great COVID cheat sheet that I need to post. But um, we've always used some arginine-containing peptide formulas, um, and I feel like they've done really well with it. They're high in protein, and they're really helpful. But I think in that first week to 10 days, I would avoid them. And when the patients become actively septic again from, say, a secondary infection, I would avoid them. But I, I think, you know, there's some reasonable data that when they get into this immunosuppressed state, then the arginine probably helps them. And so I think it's timing. Maybe we'll find with the metabolic heart, the Q energy, when they get this hypermetabolic phase, maybe that's the time to put it back. But we, we, don't, we don't have enough um, data to really say that. So I think in that first week to 10 days, I would avoid them. Um, yeah, the company that hosted the webinar this morning is Nutricia. That will be available uh, online by tomorrow. The other thing I will tell you is, and I'm preparing the slides actually today and tonight and um, now, Baxter is hosting a webinar where I'm actually going to give a lecture with slides with all the data that I've been sharing with you guys um, on Thursday morning. I'm going to tell you the time. I believe it's at 10 in the morning, but I'm going to tell you for sure. So I will be giving a lecture online that you can sign up for for free. It um, starts actually at 11 Eastern time this Thursday morning. And I, I'm making slides right now to really cover all of this data to talk about calorie delivery, to talk about micronutrients, vitamin D, some probiotics. But I, I'm going to hit on, I'm going to show some of the data from the uh, Q Energy from the device. Um, so I think... Uh, if you guys can tune in to, on, on Thursday and plan for that at 11, I'm gonna show you a lot of data and, and I think it will really be helpful because I'll be able to put all the things we've talked about together into one lecture. So I see a question from Sarah Maloney. Can you elaborate on why you wouldn't recommend a TPN um, to, for a patient who can't get to goal on two parents? I, I would recommend TPN. Sarah, I hope I, hope I didn't um, lead you astray there. Uh, I definitely would recommend TPN, I think. Um, we really need, like our asthma guidelines are saying that even, right? They're, our asthma guidelines say that we recommend TPN sooner. Again, if you're not at goal, more than 60% of goal, I would say by day four, I would start some sort of either TPN or, or supplemental PN. Um, Arthur showed some great data today that IV amino acid supplementation, even if you use very little dextrose and a lot of amino acids, had some real benefit in non-renal failure patients in a study that was done um, that I can show, for, I can post for you guys. I need to find that study. But there's some benefit of even up to 100 grams a day of IV amino acid. And so I think that is really exciting, um, potentially, that we could add <clears throat> some high-protein PP in there. <clears throat> but again, if you're going to use lipid, make sure you're not using pure interlipid. Really go for an olive oil lipid or a fish oil-based lipid, not, not the interlipid that's, that's out there. So um, to get to some of your other questions here, I want to keep going. 
How, um, are there any trends in the way of vitamin de mineral deficiency? There are other lab values upon admission. Are nutrition labs even ordered for these patients? So again, as a lot of you know, the nutrition labs in general really haven't proven to be super useful. I mean, the patients that are this inflamed, their pre-albumin is going to be on the floor because their CRP is going to be on the roof, right? And again, you can't make anabolic proteins like pre-albumin or albumin when your CRP is so high and your inflammatory proteins are so high. So I, I don't really see a use um, in the early phases, maybe almost in any of the phases until they're quite late, maybe on the floor, for the pre-albumin measure. Until the CRP is less than really four and really even less than two, you, you, it, your pre-albumin is not going to tell you very much. And, and I think lots of dietitians will, will, will tell you that too. And I think physicians will ask for it. Um, uh, you know, lots of physicians want to see those numbers, but those numbers, as we know, really when the, when the CRP is so high, the inflammatory markers like this disease creates is so high, those nutrition labs really are not super useful. Now, in terms of checking vitamin mineral deficiencies, I haven't checked a lot of patients. We, we, we haven't had a lot of patients. We've had a few go on to CRT, but not a ton. Um, I, I really think those nutrition deficiencies, unless the patient's malnourished or has really severe diarrhea, I think you're going to see those more in your CRT patients. But again, they happen in five to seven days and they're definitely going to happen. So those are the patients you need to worry about um, for these vitamin and mineral deficiencies. I think the other challenging thing we've seen is the hyperglycemia and the hypertriglyceridemia from these, from these patients, which I think is an inflammatory response, but we don't totally understand it yet. That's why we've been discouraging propofol. First, it's in a bad lipid that is immunosuppressive, creates a hyperinflammatory cytokine state. It's the same bad inner lipid that's in the TBN that we don't want to give. Propofol is made in that lipid. Propofol is a mitochondrial toxin. Um, you can teach your physicians this. It, it inhibits the uh, mitochondrial um, electron transport chain. It inhibits fatty acid transport into the cell. That's how it leads to propofol infusion syndrome. It also contributes to increased ICU acquired weakness. So the problem with that is it doesn't leave you with a lot of great sedatives. Those of those that think about the sedatives in intensive care know, and midazolam is not great either because it leads to some long-term brain dysfunction, and so it's really tough. Um, I see the omega-3 question, and, and I have been encouraging omega-3 based on the Oldham Xepa trials. There were three that showed reduced mortality in ARDS. Now, Arthur Van Zanten today showed some data from a trial he did, uh, a big trial, that looked at a combination of glutamine and a bunch of other things with fish oil in um, very early sh um, septic shock in critically ill patients. And in the medical critical care group, um, he seemed to implicate perhaps that fish oils weren't good for you. Perhaps they caused some immunosuppression beyond what you'd want in those patients when used in long term. So, so maybe, um, and I need to look into more how much fish oil was actually in that formula because that formula never made it to market. It was a nutrition study, nutrition study that never got to market because the trial wasn't positive. Um, I don't know how much fish oil was in there. I need to look. Um, I, I do think that Oxipa data was compelling for benefit. So I think if you have the formulas that we've been recommending with the low doses of fish oil in them, some of the um, peptide-based, um, both peptamin and some of the other, the Nestle Nabbit both make one that doesn't have arginine but does have a little fish oil, I still think you're probably reasonable, especially in the first week to 10 days. Perhaps after that, it's worth switching back to your peptide formulas that have a little bit of arginine in them or a standard formula um, as the patient begins to recover. Maybe fish oil long-term is not ideal for the patient. And that's what Arthur's study seems to hint. And so I think in the early phase, I think we had enough data on Oxipa to say there may be some benefit. Um, but I think in the later phase, maybe we have to think about it. And so I think we're all gonna have to look at our data over time. Um, it'd be neat to try to pull some of this data from the COVID patients and look at what we're doing. But I think early, I still would use the low doses of the fish oil that's in the non-arginine formulas. Um, and then I think I would consider later, uh, maybe switching to your standard formula or maybe back to your arginine containing formulas. So I think I'm getting questions, what sedatives are we using? Uh, I think we, we are trying a little bit of ketamine sometimes. We're using intermittent benzos. We're actually using sadly benzo drips when we paralyze patients and prone them. Um, I think a little bit of propofol, maybe a little bit of benzo, maybe a little ketamine, and then a lot of opiate, I think is a great way. If the patient's not paralyzed, you can use Presidex. And Presidex is by far the best sedative I would advocate for all these patients. Um, then transition to clonidine. Clonidine reduces mortality at five years in a study by Greet Vandenberg. So clonidine is a great agent to add later in their care. But I would use Presidex in a non-paralyzed patient, the tough patients or the paralyzed patients. Katie Van Buren's asking about proning. 
I think um, this is a question that's coming up in every uh, webinar we're giving, and I think it's worth touching on. You can definitely feed the prone patient. We're doing it at Duke. Um, people are doing it around the country, around the world. Uh, there's, there's no contraindications to feeding the prone patient. I think keeping the bed at about 25 degrees is helpful. The good news is, right, if they do have some regurgitation because they're face down, it's much more likely to come out their mouth than go down into their lungs when they're sitting supine. So in some ways, a lot of us think it may be safer to feed in the prone position because the tube feed's more likely to come out their mouth um, than otherwise. But we've had good luck um, feeding. I think it's tough to get to goal in these patients in general because they're on pressors and because they have gut involvement and because they're so sick. But the proning does not seem to be the problem. And I think you should feel very confident feeding the prone paralyzed patient. Again, I'll share with you that there was just a study from Japan that showed in a large number of patients, a couple thousand patients, that feeding within 48 hours of paralytics being started reduces death. So you should definitely be feeding your paralyzed patients. If you get questions, and this has come up in every webinar I've done, does the paralysis change the gut motility? You just guarantee them it doesn't, right? So paralytics affect skeletal muscles. So the muscles that we, you know, move our arms and move our legs, they do not affect smooth muscles. So otherwise the heart would stop and the gut would stop and they don't. So if you've ever been in the operating room, any of you that's have been through any operative rotations, um, you know that when we're operating on patients who are paralyzed, your gut keeps peristalsing. And so there is not an effect of paralytics in any way on the gut. And so you can definitely feed them. You can definitely feed the prone patient. And so I think definitely you should be thinking about doing all those things. And even patients on pressors, we know if they're on reasonable doses of pressors, say less than 0.2 mics per kilo of levofed, their lactate is normal, their mixed venous is normal, their pressure dose is coming down or is stable and they're not in shock, you should definitely be at least trophic feeding and then ramping up slowly. We've been feeding people on pressors the whole time at Duke. And the data from Japan, same group, they're doing a great job in Japan with some of this research, now in 50,000 patients shows reduced mortality when feeding is started within 48 hours on a vasopressor. And so you should definitely, I should definitely be doing that. And, and then we're checking gastric residuals in those patients. And I know it's a controversial topic, but Again, I'm, I would advocate checking gastric residuals. Our nurses are in the room every four hours anyway, so it's not a big deal for them to check the gastric residual. Um, I'm gonna try to get to the next question here. Acute care ICU questions, nutrition support and VV ECMO, formulas to use, calculations, needs. We do feed our ECMO patients. We have a few ECMO patients. Um, many of them are actually quite young. Some of our younger patients are actually on ECMO. Um, other centers are reporting the same. Um, they are being fed. They are being interly fed. Um, and so I, I wouldn't hesitate to do that. Again, I, I would follow, I would feed them gastrically because gut ischemia is always a worry. And I would also be checking residuals in them because you wanna make sure the gut's not getting ischemic. But I would definitely look at feeding them while they're in ECMO and watching your residuals and, and making sure they're stooling and, and doing all the things you normally would do. Uh, because they too will end up with severe ICU cord weakness like everybody else. And so, um, Next question, I see thoughts on high flow nasal cannula and enteral feeding, especially with proning. Um, we have been trying to turn some of our non-intubated patients over too. We try to ask some of the patients to turn themselves over when they're not intubated even because that will improve their oxygenation. Um, I, I've had mixed success trying to convince my elderly patients to do that um, who are not intubated. Most of them don't really want to, but you can. Um, you can feed on high flow enteral or nasal cannulas, of course. Um, the interesting part here is, right, the patient's gonna be awake and, and they probably aren't gonna be thrilled to have a feeding tube, although clearly try to talk them into it because it's most of the time they're too sick to really eat anything meaningful. And so I definitely think that a high flow nasal cannula, you should be trying to feed them. BiPAP is a more challenging subject. We don't have a lot of centers with the helmet BiPAPs they have in Europe, which I think are much easier to feed on. The face mask BiPAP is really tough. And so hopefully your patients aren't sticking on face mask BiPAP for too long because that is tough to feed on. It fills the stomach up with air. Um, and, I, and I really think that's something that you're gonna have to, to limit. Um, so, but I, I definitely advocate feeding on proning, like I said before. Thoughts on diabetic formulas to manage blood sugars in vended patients? Um, should we use standard formulas and adjust insulin? Um, that's a great question. I, I think it's to your discretion what you do. I think the key is, can you get enough protein in with those formulas? And can you, can you get enough of, of the things you need in for the patient? Um, I think otherwise, insulin drips are okay. Although the challenge with insulin drips we're finding is, how do you check the blood glucose? 
because now if you're gonna do hourly glucoses, the nurses are not gonna be in the room hourly. And so in the couple patients that I've had to do insulin drips on um, here at Duke, we've been going to every two hours checks because typically they're in the room about every two hours. And so we're checking about every two hours, which isn't perfect, but I think is better than having a glucose of 250 or 300. And so it may not be unreasonable to do diabetic formulas, but you probably are gonna to have to supplement some protein in with them. And so you wanna make sure you're reaching protein goals. That's the most important thing you can do, I think for these patients in many ways to prevent that muscle loss to the best of your ability, or at least attenuate it. Um, all of you should know in terms of bolus feeding, there was just that paper from Danny Baer in England and Zudan Puticherry was just published um, in CHEST. And it showed that bolus feeding is just as safe as continuous feeding and leads to better um, achievement of caloric and protein goals than continuous feeding does. And I, I think those of you who are listening from last time know that at Duke that we deliver uh, bolus feeding routinely in our trauma patients, we always have. And so those of you that need to go to bolus feeding definitely do. Um, I think it's uh, Danny and, and Zudin showed us it's just as safe as continuous feeds. 180 cc's Q3 is not a bad place to be feeding at when you get to goal. Um, there's some great papers I can share with all of you if you want. You can look on Instagram or on my Twitter feed. Um, I've been sharing them there too and I'll share them on the Facebook feed. But there's, I've shared a lot of good things about bolus feeding. I think you should definitely be thinking about it. Um, Emily Jane asked, are we still running D5 in the background? Uh, and so I think, yeah, I think that is not a bad idea. Um, I, we are doing that with the insulin drips because there's a fair bit of data from some of the early glucose trials that showed that Greed Vandenberg always ran dextrose in the background in her trials and her patients tended to not have some of the complications from hypoglycemia that other people's patients had. So having some dextrose running in the background, I think is very important and, and protective on an insulin drip. And I can't explain all the reasons why, but the data seems to show that. So when I was, I can think of a patient um, two weeks ago when I was on service and during the day and I was running um, an insulin drip, they can only check every two hours in a prone, really sick patient with COVID and we were running D5 and even D10, we actually used D10 because it was less fluid volume in the background. So running D10 may be good too. So I think that's not unreasonable either. Um, so, you know, I think if you really need to pay attention to the glucoses and I think running D10 is not a bad way to do it. So thoughts on TPN and, and risks of fungemia. We know without a doubt that TPN does not increase your risk of fungemia in modern practice. Um, from four large trials, one in New England Journal, two in Lancet, and one in JAMA. They did not show any increases in fungal or bacterial infections, not line infections, not any kind of infection. I'm more than happy to send you those papers to plead your case, but there is no increased risk of fungemia or bacteremia in a patient who already has a central line, which almost all of them do, for, oh, now I can hear my puppy, um, for patients who um, are on TPN. So I would not be worried about it causing fungemia, and I would not be worried about it causing infection. So again, this is our chance to educate a whole generation of ICU physicians and other physicians on the safety of TPN and that it doesn't cause infection, it doesn't cause fungemia. Um, and, and there's lots of great papers in the biggest of journals, big trials that show this very equivocally. Again, no more risk of giving TPN um, versus even giving saline. So saline is, TPN is just as safe as giving saline through that central line once you have it. And so I really want to drive that point home to everybody. So I'm going to move down a little bit now in the questions. Um, Post-acute illness rehab. When do we feel patients are out of the acute phase and could benefit from increased needs? So we're seeing that with the acute energy metabolic card. I, I, at the beginning of this, those of you who may not be there at the beginning, we're doing a study again of um, multiple metabolic cards. Thanks to Baxter for helping to sponsor that absolutely and providing us with the metabolic cards. We have two acute energy devices now. Um, we are definitely seeing at week two and three a big jump in caloric needs in these patients and the couple that we're doing, and we're doing more every day now. Um, they are needing anywhere from 2,700, 2,900 calories in the, in the men. Um, 140, 160% are predicted. Um, VO2s in the 400s, that's really high for those of you who don't think about VO2s very often. Um, so again, it does seem like these patients, second, third weekend, especially as they begin to wean on the ventilator, um, I think once you're weaning someone, not paralyzing them anymore, they're weaning on the vent, they're moving towards extubation, 
Um, they seem to need more calories and more pro. I mean, I definitely would be giving the protein the whole time pretty much. Um, aside from the first three days, we need to ramp it up. And we talked about protein ramps last time. But I do think that the needs are perhaps more impressive than we thought. I'll continue to share data with you guys on this. Um, I, I think that this is something that we're really shocked by, that the needs were bigger than I expected. So, so the next question is, can you discuss at all nutrition patients receive, can you discuss at all nutrition patients receive an ICU acute phases and how it impacts ICU who required weakness? So we know from a trial, those of you who may be familiar with the Redox trial, that was a glutamine and antioxidant trial that Darren Highland and I did, it was a New England Journal a few years ago. We took the patients, the long stayers in that group, the people that were intubated more than eight days, like all our COVID patients are, and we looked at the effects of increased calories and protein at three and at six months quality of life. And we found that for every 25% increase in the first eight days that patients received in total calories and protein, it improved quality of life at three and at six months, especially in the medical patients like COVID patients. So how you feed in that first eight to 10 days can permanently affect the quality of life your patients see months and months later. And so we do have good data um, on this and, and I think we'll continue to have more and we're planning some rehab trials now as part of, of the metabolic CART studies we're doing. Um, and so I think we'll get more and more data. We're gonna to try to follow some of these patients out to three and six months as well and get some quality of life. So again, what you guys do as dietitians is changing people's lives months and years later, probably permanently. So uh, you guys have to know that you are the hero frontline providers that are giving these patients a chance to get their lives back. And it's really challenging right now because a lot of surgical recommendations from societies are not, in the US, are not recommending trachs. So we're not able to trach patients like we normally would, which is gonna make the ICU card weakness and the rehab process go even longer. They're tracking people regularly in Europe. Um, in fact, Elizabeth and I may write a paper about that because I really am hopeful we'll start to do that more in the US because it's really delaying our rehab. But you guys have a chance to really change that with ensuring they're getting good nutrition in that first week. If they're getting 50% of their nutrition needs in the first week, you are going to have an impaired quality of life, our data would say, months later. So again, saying, oh my gosh, tomorrow we'll get to goal. Oh my gosh, tomorrow we'll get to goal. We're at 40%, we're at 50%. Don't, don't fall into that trap. That is impairing people's quality of life, our data would say, months later, maybe even years later. We, we don't know, but we think that's probably true. So that's where your supplemental PN or using a prokinetic, don't give it with chloroquine. Reglan increases QT just like chloroquine does. Don't give Reglan and chloroquine together. Um, but Reglan might help find a way to get to goal or find a way to get them on TPN because that first eight to 10 days matters a lot. And then your caloric needs seem to really jump. So if you're not getting to even your goal, plus probably a little more in those later times, you are really underfeeding these people and you're gonna waste a lot of muscle and their quality of life is gonna drop. So you guys have a chance to markedly change the course of an entire nation's quality of life right now by ensuring they're getting the feeding they need, whether it be by PN or EN, um, in the early first week to 10 days of their care and then out after that as well. We're, we're still feeding, feeding challenges in these patients. So there is relationship to quality of life. So the next question that we have here, further discuss arginine is some clinicians say it's beneficial, some are conflicting. Would I use arginine and glutamine and juvenile? We talked about this a little bit. Um, again, we, we, we are not suggesting arginine in that first week. We are not suggesting arginine probably even maybe for the first 10 to 14 days. Um, there is some signals of increased mortality, but I'm, I'm beginning to come around to maybe after 10 to 14 days as the patients improve, maybe start thinking about giving something either a two feed with arginine or the juven because I really love the HMB and the data is very compelling for HMB's benefit. Um, I, I would think about maybe putting that back. Um, I might even be tempted to pour the insurance Live down the tube to get the HMB into the patient um, to try to help them um, and maybe switching to that as part of your tube feeding regimen. Um, but again, Juven's another way to do it. Uh, don't give the glutamine and the arginine for sure in renal failure, um, unless they're on CVVH. So anybody who's got renal injury cannot be getting glutamine, so they cannot be getting Juven. We know that acute renal failure that is not dialyzed, when glutamine is given, they have a higher mortality. Um, and so we don't want to do it in the renally impaired patient who's not getting dialyzed. Now, when patients are getting dialyzed, our data seem to hint they lose glutamine, and then it might be some time when it's probably maybe even beneficial to give something with a little glutamine in it, but not in the renal injured patient who is not getting dialysis. But later in care, when the kidney function's good, 
you're two weeks in, they're starting to wean on the vent, but they're weak. I'm, I'm, I'm coming around to the idea of, of maybe Juven or, or, or some arginine, but definitely H and B being beneficial, but not early. Um, so post extubation, when the tube comes out and the patients pass a swallow study and when they're eating a certain amount, um, would I take, it's the question is, would you take the feeding tube out? And I would probably say I wouldn't, um, unless you know they're gonna take in a lot, which I can almost guarantee they're not. We know from research um, that was done in Australia um, that, that showed that patients who are getting post-ICU feeding, who don't have a feeding tube, get maybe 700 calories at best. They are very poor at delivering their needs. Um, you, you definitely, if you're gonna do that, you're gonna need a high protein ONS. Again, I would use the HMB containing ones. Um, I, I work with a lot of different companies, so I'm recommending an product. It's only because that's the only one the HMB and it's the only one that is a large randomized clinical trial, the, the NURSE trial that showed of having of mortality at 90 days in patients who got um, end of hospital and post hospital um, care with this particular tube feed formula with HMB. And so that large trial, it was in 70 plus centers in over 600 patients, I think is one of the few really compelling single randomized control trials showing a benefit of ONS. Um, we have some other ONS benefit trials, but not with a specific product, of course. We have lots of data to say ONS is good, but that is a specific product trial that I think you can feel good about, and HMB has got a lot of good data for it. So I, I would avoid taking the feeding tubes out at all cost um, because there, there's just no way they're gonna eat enough. This disease, people feel bad for long periods of time, it seems like, from what we're learning. Even physicians I've talked to say that sometimes they don't feel great for a couple weeks. Um, so I, I definitely think that this is a time when you need the feeding tube, you need to be aggressive with your nutrition, and the recovery phase is probably the most important time for protein. That might even be a time you wanna come in with an anabolic agent too, like oxandrolone and testosterone, but definitely HMB and your high protein. So at what point is it safe to place a peg in these patients? I've had patients where they'll get a trach, but the team won't place a peg. That's a great question, and I don't have a good answer for it. I think every surgeon's gonna see this differently. Our surgeons and many surgeons around the country, I think because of the American College of Surgeons recommendations at the moment are not tracking people even out to 21 days and they're asking for COVID negative state, which a lot of patients do not have. And so I, I hope that changes. I think we need to treat these patients with good critical care like we would any other patient. I think we as anesthesiologists are in the airway a lot. We protect ourselves. I talked to Elizabeth today, you know, Elizabeth DeWally in Brussels. She herself is, percutaneously tracking patients on a regular basis with COVID. She wears an N95, she wears her face mask, she's not even wearing a papper. So around the world, we are tracking people early. We need to look towards that in the US and we'll need our surgical colleagues to find some consensus amongst themselves. I know it's a challenge. I know they feel like there's risks, but, but again, I think our patients deserve this. I don't know when the peg will happen. Um, so I, I don't know that people are gonna be excited to do that procedure anytime soon on these patients. I think it'll be very center specific. Um, what persistent health issues are you seeing for those who survived critical care in COVID-19? We don't have a lot of data for that yet, of course, but I can tell you that we are excited to hopefully get some funding from the NIH and maybe even self-fund some of it, where we are going to start piloting some cardiopulmonary exercise testing or CPEC guided exercise, where we send patients home, we send them home with an iPhone and an iWatch, and we do a cardiopulmonary exercise test with them before they go home in their hospital room where they walk up and down steps. So we do a graded step test and we target HIT training for them, um, high intensity training for them that we supervise through the iPhone with them at home. We're doing this in our bone marrow transplant patients at Duke. Um, it's working really well. Um, we have all the CPET testing equipment here. And so we're really excited to start meaningful, targeted CPET guided HIT training with our recovered um, COVID patients and maybe our other ICU patients as well. And so I think this is a huge opportunity maybe to get some funding from the NIH or from other places, industry and other places, to finally establish some really meaningful in-home, using all the new devices like the iPhone in front of me right now, um, opportunities to target exercise training to help people recover. This is what we needed for years. You guys as dietitians are essential in ensuring they get to that point and get the nutrition they need because we'll incorporate a nutrition component into these home trials. But the ICU acquired weakness after COVID, we suspect is going to be devastating like we've never seen because these patients are staying intubated longer, they're paralyzed, they're getting more benzos, they are not getting trached early, so they're not getting mobilized, they're not walking on the vent, um, they're very difficult to feed as you're all discovering. 
Um, so the, I mean, I think there a lot of people are probably getting 50% of goal. I really would encourage all of you to report on rounds every day, the percent of protein and the percent of prescribed calories that they're getting every day. And I really want you to track back. I was on call the other night. I was looking back and some of these patients are just really hard to feed despite our best intentions. And I would encourage you to start some peripheral parental or not peripheral, but supplemental parental nutrition sooner. Even if it's largely protein you're giving and maybe some of the beneficial lipids, if you have them, um, but find a way to get the protein and calories into these patients, especially after the say day four or five. I think you just cannot be markedly underfeeding them after day four or five. I think the good news is in the first three days, and I saw a question go by about this, again, for the first two to three days, you only want to give 0.8 grams per kilo in that protovent trial that Arthur Manzan did and I posted on the website, you can find it, showed that people who got 0.8 grams per kilo in those first two to three days had better mortalities than patients who got more than that in the first two to three days. So again, like your calories need to ramp up. Again, I would start at somewhere between 10 and 15 kcals per kilo, so this goal shouldn't be hard to get to. And then I would give 0.8 grams per kilo for the first three days, and then say day four, go to 1.2 grams, and then after that, say five and six, go to 1.5 grams per kilo. And that's the protein ramp we were talking about, and that paper is online for you guys um, on the Facebook page. And then again, with your calories, same. I think you can start at 70% of predicted for those first three to four days. Again, you're talking somewhere between 10 and 15 kcals per kilo. And then by day five to seven, you're gonna increase probably to 15 to 20. And it looks like perhaps after day 10, especially as they improve, now you're getting into maybe much more 25 to 30. I mean, I'm seeing again, the metabolic cart readings, the Q energy readings being anywhere from 24 to 2,900 calories resting metabolic rate in these patients. Um, and so energy expenditures are very impressive, much higher than I would have expected. We'll continue to get data and, and get that to you to try to help you. But I think these are some of the best things you can do for your patients early on to try to improve their, their recovery later on. So I'm gonna give you guys, if you wanna post any other questions quickly here, um, I think we can take five more minutes and I can try to answer them. I, I think I've tried to get through all the questions that you put through this particular set of questions you sent me and I wanna thank you guys for all sending those in. And again, continue to say thank you for the amazing things. I, I didn't show this last time, but my passion for nutrition, as some of you know, comes from my own personal experience. Um, as a kid with inflammatory bowel disease, I was on TPN for a year. Dietitians saved my life. And so I have the utmost respect. You guys are my heroes. You're the reason that I went into nutrition. You're the reason I went into medicine and you're the reason I'm alive. And so you have that chance to do this for many, many patients right now. Again, you guys are truly the heroes that will give people back their lives in all of this. So I'm gonna look real quick if you have other questions. If I'm ordering a TPN for a COVID patient on high doses of propofol, I will hold off on lipid. Yeah, um, definitely so. I think that's a challenge, right? I think, unfortunately, that's a bad lipid in the propofol. So if you can push your physicians to drop that and look at, if they're not paralyzed, use Presidex. You can't use Presidex in paralyzed patients. It doesn't cause amnesia. So you can't have awake patients like that. But if they're not paralyzed, um, definitely, um, get them off the propofol, get them onto higher doses of, of, of the opiates um, because you're going to need that with your Presidex to make it work. Presidex without a lot of opiate doesn't work. And so when Presidex, when you hear doctors say, oh, the Presidex doesn't work, it's because they're not giving enough of the pain medicine, of the fentanyl, of the Dilaudid. Use Dilaudid, they're going to tachyflax the fentanyl too quickly for as long as they're sick. So, um, so I, I see a question from Kendall again. So if it's interlipids or none, then none. I wouldn't say that none, I would probably go to what we used to do, um, and some of you are, will, 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 that have neurolipids will remember this, um, we used to give it sometimes twice a week or three times a week, or even if they're really sick, once a week. You still need to give some lipid, but you just can't give very much. Now, most of the time, sadly, these patients are gonna be getting some propofol, so they're probably not gonna have problems with essential fatty acids, but you don't wanna give no lipid for long periods of time either. You probably wanna give less. Um, and so I think, Please, I implore all of you to get a new lipid on your formulary. I think if anything out of this COVID epidemic, if we can get an olive oil-based lipid or a fish oil-based lipid on everyone's formularies, that's an enormous win for our patients. Um, and so I think uh, that is really, really important. Um, I will post a link to the Baxter webinar. I'm actually was planning to post it tonight. Um, I have some information from them that has all the link information and all this other information. I will look to post that tonight and probably again in the morning. So Thursday morning again at 11 a.m. Is this, is this webinar and I'm gonna present slides with all of the data and all of the references that you guys have been hearing about and try to cover the best I can all this stuff um, so that you have it all in one place. 
This is, Ashley um, just asked if this is being recorded. It is being recorded. Um, Priscilla and the group in New York who, who have done such an amazing job with the COVID Nutrition Facebook group. Um, we were able to record the last one and we posted it on YouTube. It's on my YouTube page. Um, I, I have a YouTube page. Um, uh, it's under Glutamine Doc. Um, I used to do a lot of glutamine research, so that's my name for that. Um, so you can watch uh, the videos either on this page or you can go to my YouTube page. I have a lot of nutrition uh, lectures and videos on quality of life and other things if you want to watch those too um, that, that I talk about. And then I'm posting a lot of these things on Twitter. So if you go to my Twitter page, uh, Paul underscore Wishmeyer, or if you go to my Instagram page, Paul underscore Wishmeyer MD, I have a lot of information on there too. So you'll find some of it there. I'll post the links to this video on those pages, but it will be for those of you who missed it, it will be there. And uh, so you can see anything you missed later. And, and, and I just um, encourage you, to, if you have a time on Thursday morning, I really would encourage you to tune into the Baxter webinar. These have been very well attended, the ones they've had before. And um, I'm really gonna try to take all the things you guys have taught me and all the things you guys have helped me learn from your experiences and put it into this lecture um, at that uh, webinar that Baxter is sponsoring that morning on Thursday morning. So um, again, uh, I'm getting a lot of nice thank yous and I really appreciate this from a lot of people I know. I see Dina Hirsch and Juliana Machado, um, people from all around the world. Um, it is really great to see all of you here. Um, these are people I interact with all the time in, in, in real life, which is great. And I haven't been able to see them, of course, in a long time. So um, again, I, I can't say thank you enough to all of you that you guys are doing as dietitians. Realize you are truly heroes. You guys are truly saving lives and, and you need to continue to fight this fight, bring data and fight for your patients to be fed. I know it is not easy. Um, I think the dietitian has one of the hardest jobs in the hospital and because we as physicians have the least amount of education about nutrition. You guys are the only ones that have it. Um, we know that 75% of medical schools don't teach any clinical nutrition. And so realize you are the only advocate the patients have and you have to fight for them. And so um, thank you for all that you do. Um, stay strong through all this, stay safe through all this. And I look forward to having more chances to talk to you guys and, and hopefully um, connect with you on more of these webinars and, and more of these Facebook Lives. And thanks to the COVID-19 Nutrition Group moderators who made this possible, Priscilla and, and her whole team. Um, you guys have done an amazing service to critical care and to nutrition and for dietitians around the country and around the world. So I think with that, it's, it's 9.15 and uh, I want to make sure you guys uh, get a chance to good night's sleep. Everybody needs a good night's sleep. For all of you, I encourage you to be taking your vitamin D, 4,000 IU of D3 every night. Take your lactobacillus GG, your cultural every night. Maybe some vitamin C as well. Um, keep yourselves healthy. Get enough sleep. Exercise as much as you can um, and do the things you need to do um, because we need to be strong for our patients right now. So thanks to everybody and I look forward to talking to you again soon and, and everybody have a good night and stay safe. Take care.